Hello, everyone. Thank you for your presence. Uh, welcome to the first edition of the CAVE Show, a series of seminars organized within the International Year of Caves and Cars, of which the virtual opening took place today. My name is Marta Santos. I am a science communication officer at the Center for Ecology, Evolution, and Environmental Changes in Portugal, which is the organizing institution of this event. During the seminar, you can leave your questions on the YouTube live chat on your right here on the screen. And we will ask these questions then to our invited for the idea of the case show is Ana Sofia Revoleira, researcher at the Center for Ecology, Evolution and Environmental Changes, to whom I now give the floor without further delay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marta. Good evening, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where in the world you are. Earlier today, we've had the opening ceremony of the International Year of Caves and Karst 2021 ceremony that is now on YouTube. So you can follow it's a one hour event with a lot of interesting information about caves and karst. And we are starting now a series of seminars about cave science um, targeted for a broad audience. And uh, not only about cave science, but also about our passion for caves. I am thrilled and honored to host our first speaker, Dr. George Venny, the president of the International Union of Speleology. We have here today co-hosting this event with us, Professor Steinetti Klauritsen from the University of Bergen in Norway, who will present our guest here today. Steinetti. Okay, thank you. I have the great honor to present uh, an old friend of mine, the, the, uh, Dr. George Denny, who um, has a very long CV, which is too long to read in full here. But in short, George is the director of the uh, of the, uh, uh, National Karsten Cave Research Institute in the in the U.S. in New Mexico, and you might know him through the numerous uh, and very useful e-posts he is sending around about the news in the Karst world. George has also been associated with the uh, International Union of Speleology for several uh, uh, decades. He has uh, served as a vice president for two periods. And since 2017, during the conference in Sydney, Australia, he was elected president of the International Union of Speleology. And he is also a well reputed. Yeah, I found for president of the international. He is, uh, he is uh, also a well reputed cave uh, uh, scientist, uh, having worked in uh, in karst hydrology and in with cave protection and things like that. And he's now going to give us a, a lecture about caves and karst and the importance it has for the world. Please, George, the audience is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Stein Eric. It's, uh, it's good to see you again, and it's uh, excellent to, uh, to be here with everyone uh, for, this, uh, for this presentation. So I thank you for the kind invitation. I'm honored to be the first speaker of, uh, of this lecture series. Um, and what I'm doing is uh, I'm going to talk about um, about caves and cursed and their importance to science in the world. Um, many of you, I believe, are either scientists or science students. And so, uh, but even if you're just someone from the general public, uh, I want to give, uh, give this idea of why caves are so important. Why should we uh, be concerned about them and also potential careers that are available in the caves and cursed science because many times people ask, well, why are you doing an international year about caves and what is karst? They don't understand the value. And so that's one of the goals of the international year is to teach people about these things. So we'll go ahead and, uh, and get started. So let's answer 
the basic question, what is karst? Um, karst is a type of terrain, a type of landscape. It's formed primarily by the dissolving of the bedrock. And most landscapes are formed by mechanical erosion, but, but in karst, it's chemical erosion. And typically we see it in carbonate rocks, limestones, dolomite, and marble. But we also see it in arid climates, in uh, evaporite rocks, such as halite uh, and gypsum. Uh, common features that we have in karst are caves, sinkholes, underground streams, and most of the largest springs in the world. The photo that you see here from China, everything you see here is karst. We have a cave system here that was dissolved out by the water. It's now the roof has collapsed and the water comes from a cave entrance below where I took the photo. The entrance is about 150 meters high. And the mountains you see in the background, they were not pushed up but they rather they were dissolved down, which is one of the features of karst landscapes. So where is karst? Um, karst covers approximately 20% of the land surface of the planet. We see it here in green. It does not include the evaporite karst areas, uh, not extensively. So we need to uh, the map that we did in 2017, we need to uh, continue to improve this. Uh, but you see that it covers, uh, it occurs on all of the continents all over the world. Uh, Europe has the highest percentage of karst among the continents. If we zoom into Portugal, uh, we'll see that karst occurs uh, primarily along the east coast, the central east coast of the country, down in the south. But also in the northern area, I'm familiar with some pseudo karst. Um, pseudo karst is, an, uh, is a type of landform, a type of area where you have karst like features, but not formed by dissolving of the bedrock, but by other processes. We don't have time to discuss those, but there was a conference uh, about uh, in that area, I believe about two or three years ago, uh, looking at pseudo karst. Just a little bit about my institute, the National Cave and Karst Research Institute. We were created by the, the US government and with the following goals that you can read here, but simply they are to promote, to conduct and to support cave and karst research, management, education, collection and archiving of data and collaborations that support all of these things nationally and internationally. So another word that's important for everyone to understand, uh, I'm sure it's familiar to many people, uh, is aquifer. Why do I wanna talk about aquifers? And the main reason is because we will spend a lot of time talking about karst aquifers. So how is a karst aquifer different from other types of aquifers? Each of these squares that you see here is at a different scale. So if we start with a porous media aquifer, this is a microscopic scale. What you see here would be grains of sand, little pieces of silt or gravel. And in this porous media aquifer, the water flows around these grains of sand to move upward and out uh, through, the, uh, through this aquifer. As it moves through these tiny, tiny spaces, the water gets filtered. It moves in a uniform, predictable fashion. Computer models work very well studying and predicting groundwater movement in this type of aquifer. Then we have another type of aquifer, a fracture aquifer. This scale here is probably at the scale that you're seeing it in front of you. Uh, these are little cracks in the ground. Sometimes they're larger, sometimes they're smaller. Uh, it forms oftentimes in a uh, uh, and granite type aquifers, whereas porous media may form in sandstones, this will form in granite. Here, the water will move through these various cracks, again, following a general direction, but more slightly more complicated uh, flow paths. In karst, we have far more complicated flow paths, but the scale is different. Now these openings, are large. They, they may be as small as cracks as you see here, or they could be as large that you can fly a giant airplane through these things. I've been in some that were large enough for, for this. Passages that were 
over 100 meters wide uh, and you know, 20, 30, 50 meters high. Um, so we are talking here about very complicated, large to small um, systems, groundwater systems. But an aquifer, I didn't, I forgot to, to mention, an aquifer by definition though, is an underground reservoir of water. And it must be, to be called an aquifer, it must be economically accessible for use because you could have maybe a cup of water underground, but is it economically worth going for a cup of water? No. So it needs to be accessible economically for use. So that's all an aquifer is, an underground reservoir of water. But this shows you three major types of aquifers. Now let's focus on karst aquifers. How do they form? What happens is that water moves down along fractures through the karst. And as the water moves through these fractures, I'm not going to get into the chemistry of it, uh, but the fractures are dissolved and eventually some of, the, some of them will become large enough to become a conduit. A conduit um, is, uh, is something that's basically about 10 millimeters in diameter or larger. Uh, and I'll explain that in a, in a moment, why 10 millimeters or larger is important. And let's say about the size of your little finger or larger. So what happens is we have water moving down. Uh, some are in, in large in the conduits. When the conduits form, because water can move more easily through the conduits, then it captures water from the other fractures because uh, I, I, I sometimes joke around and say that water is smart. Uh, it, finds the, it finds the easiest way to move through the ground. So instead of continuing down through cracks this way, the water is gonna divert over this way. And because you have more water dissolving away the conduit, it grows faster and larger still. And when that conduit becomes large enough for a person to enter, we call it a cave. So a conduit, hydrologically speaking, geochemically speaking, in terms of how it transports contaminants and sediments, a conduit is very much like a cave. The only difference is that a cave is something that people can enter. And we'll get back to conduits, so don't forget about them. So how do karst aquifers work? This is just a general schematic. Rain falls from the sky and it enters the karst system in different ways. If you have non-karst rock, it may run off there and dissolve the rock and go quickly down to the water table. In most areas, it will move down through fractures. Uh, you might see it in a cave as your speleothems, your stalactites, your stalagmites that are forming. In some places, you'll have what we call in the United States sinkholes. In Europe and much of the world, they're called uh, dolines or dolinas, um, where, the, where the fractures are dissolved into this funnel-shaped uh, opening designed to put water underground. In other places, sinkholes are formed by collapse where it fell into, a, into an opening down here, but also water can go down uh, quickly down to the water table. The water table is shown by this dotted line. Below the water table, all cracks, crevices, conduits, uh, caves are completely filled with water. So below the water table, the water is gonna move horizontally, primarily in a horizontal direction to drain out to a valley, to a spring, maybe to the ocean. Above the water table, the water wants to drain vertically to reach that water table. Now, some water in some situations may go deeper still, uh, may find a deep route and go underneath what we call a confining unit, uh, a piece, a section of impermeable rock that may be much larger, of course, than what I'm showing here. And the water cannot move up through this rock, so it's trapped below until it eventually finds uh, a fault or some other crack that it can spill out to the surface. Um, so karst aquifers evolve over time. This cave passage here may have been a spring. It probably was a spring long ago when the valley was had its floor down at this elevation. Then the valley cut lower and now we have water here uh, spilling out here. As the water table continues to drop due to natural erosion and cutting of the valley, this passage will become abandoned and water will flow through here. So uh, karst aquifers are very complicated systems. People ask me, how old is the water in karst? Is it a few hours old? Is it a few months old, hundreds or thousands of years old? And I say the answer is yes, 
It's all of the above because we have water here within the rock in the tightest openings of the rock that may be tens of thousands of years old. Uh, water within cracks that may be a hundred years old or a thousand years old. Water moving through some of the larger uh, uh, openings uh, that may be just a few hours old and certainly uh, in, in the caves and you know, the caves that may be again, only a few hours old if it, if it had just rained. Uh, so the chemistry, the hydrology is very complicated in karst aquifers, making them the most complicated types of aquifers in the world. So what are the benefits? Why do we care about caves and karst and how do they uh, affect uh, science? My training is as a karst hydrogeologist. Uh, a recent study has shown that about 10% of the world's population, about 700 million people around the world depend on karst aquifers as their only or main primary source of drinking water. And so that's, that's huge. That's a huge number of people, 700 million people around the world. Also, biologically, when most people think of cave biology, they think of bats. And so we'll stay with bats just for a moment. Bats are known to produce over 450 different foods, medicines, and industrial products. They do that directly or indirectly. They're also very important for tropical reforestation uh, in tropical areas. Other animals in, uh, in caves have other diverse benefits. Caves for biologists are ideal natural laboratories. The ecosystems on the surface of the planet are very complicated. Uh, the cave ecosystems are much simpler in many ways and so they're ideal labs um, for uh, uh, that are great for, for many, many studies. Cultural resources. Once a cave is no longer active hydrologically and it's dry, um, then whatever is left in the cave is preserved for thousands of years undisturbed. So caves contain many of the most important and interesting archeological sites in the world. Uh, this panel that you see uh, from uh, uh, the Maya area in Guatemala is about two and a half meters long. Uh, it's beautifully done, as you can see. But the paint that they used did not dry the way paint does in your house. If you go up to this and you touch it, it will smear, it will destroy it automatically. This would not survive on the surface. Um, the writings that we are finding from the Maya uh, in caves are very different from what we see in the temples. I've found footprints in caves. I've found baskets and clothing and other things from ancient peoples in caves uh, that would not have survived on the surface. So caves preserve important information that would not be protected and preserved anywhere else. Economically, um, there was a study showing that in 2019, over 150 million people visited tourist caves, show caves, as they're called, uh, around the world in uh, two, uh, over 150 million. This resulted in billions of euros, billions of dollars worth of income for the show cave industry. But if we think beyond just the show caves and we think about the hotels, we think about the restaurants, we think about the uh, gasoline, rental cars, uh, uh, the gifts, the books, the videos, all those things that drive an economy. We're looking easily at tens and tens of billions of euros of economic value just from tourist caves. Also, karst areas are often some of the most scenic in the world. There are over 90 UNESCO World Heritage Sites and over 70 UNESCO Global Geoparks established at least in part because of caves and karst. Another economic benefit is pest control. Uh, this cave here, Carlsbad Cavern, which is about 30 miles from where I'm sitting right now in New Mexico. Um, in the evening, people come out to the park and they watch the bats fly out of the cave. Um, in the United States alone, the bats in this country go out and they eat insects that are pests for agriculture. And they save American agriculture $23 billion a year in pesticides that do not need to be applied 
onto the fields. That doesn't even consider the cost of the health benefits of not having those chemicals in our environment. One other important economic benefit of karst that's often forgotten is something called paleokarst. This is where you have a karst landscape that was exposed on the surface long ago and got pushed underground. And then within those larger cavities that we have in karst, uh, oil and other minerals have been deposited. The map here shows you different type of oil deposits that occur in carbonate rocks, karstifiable rocks around the world. The most important are the carbon oil provinces that you see in pink. And so if you look, we see the area of Arabia, Libya, Venezuela, uh, West Texas, major, the major oil producing areas of the world are pumping out of paleo karst. And so karst has uh, many important economic benefits for the entire world. Now, every area of course has its problems, has its difficulties and karst is no different. It has many benefits, but it also has many challenges. So if we talk about groundwater problems, water quantity is a concern. So here is a cave in Lebanon, and here are a couple of people for scale. Um, karst aquifers have a high capacity for rapid recharge to rapidly refill, put water into these aquifers. So here this, uh, uh, this cave captures a stream from the surface and the water goes down, uh, falls about 67 meters down into the cave, into the water table. And so you say, okay, we can fill up this aquifer quickly. But if we go to the bottom of the mountain, we'll find that the water can also very easily discharge from the karst aquifer. And again, here's a person for scale and here's some other people for scale. So it's an enormous, an enormous cave. Many times people mismanage karst aquifers because they drill down, they find a cave, they can pump a lot of water and they think they have an infinite water supply. When in fact, uh, it's a finite water supply. It's just that they can take water out rapidly and so they can drain a karst aquifer faster then it can be recharged and replenished. Contamination is a big problem in karst. Um, there are two main sources of contaminants that happen in all aquifers, but in karst, uh, of course, that's, it's a big concern. Uh, Non-point source, meaning that the contaminants don't come from a point location, but they're widely spread. So for example, in agricultural areas, fertilizers, pesticides, uh, contaminated soils can wash into a cave uh, such as this one that's in an agricultural area. There's a big pig uh, doing what it does, going down to take a, take a drink of water, but it's also leaving behind some surprises in the water that we wouldn't want to drink. Uh, we also have point sources of contamination um, where at a, at a particular point in a particular location, someone can dump or spill something, underground storage tanks. In this case, we have a cave entrance that's filled with garbage. Uh, so all the water that moves down into this cave, into the aquifer through this cave, is moving through all of this garbage that's been there for many years. And we don't know what's there, what sort of chemicals, what sort of uh, other contaminants may be there. Um, and so a lot of times when people focus on caves and karst, and they're concerned about protecting them, they look for cave entrances, they look for sinkholes, places that they can go and protect, but it's more complicated than that. So um, first of all, you know, we need to recognize that in caves and cars, there is effectively no filtration that occurs. My friend here, uh, he takes one step, he will fall 18 meters down to the water table. He will not be filtered out of the, uh, out of the aquifer, he will be in the aquifer. This muddy water is going into the aquifer without filtration. And you say, well, maybe it's just muddy water. But in fact, within the soils, the mud that's there, uh, chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, other chemicals, oils, grease, they adhere, they, they, they collect on the sediments and wash into the aquifer and there's no filtration. Here's another cave, um, this one in Greece. Uh, this black stuff you see is water, believe it or not. Um, 
and you can see all the garbage that's not filtered, that's not been filtered out, that's in the water. But more significantly is that uh, there are toxic chemicals within this water. We're not going into the water. We've actually wrapped our wrapped our boots uh, with uh, with plastic boots uh, to to make sure that we don't get any chemicals on us. And the, these sorts of problems occur around the world. So there is no filtration that occurs in cars. Now let's let's examine that a little bit more closely. Here's an example of a cave uh, in Texas uh, that I studied many years ago. We mapped it down to almost 80 meters in depth. Um, it has a, a small entrance and then there's a small doline off to the side. It captures water from a very small area, um, you know, just a few meters of you know a few square meters uh, when it rains goes into the entrance and uh, and into this little doline. But when it rains, what happens is that water from a much larger area within 10 minutes or 20 minutes uh, will move down through fractures uh, into this cave in many locations. And within 20 minutes of a storm, you have a stream that's formed uh, that goes all the way down to the aquifer. If you sample the water in this stream, it's the same chemical quality as the water on the surface. So if the water is contaminated on the surface, it's contaminated down here. The water is not being filtered by these conduits and these cracks uh, and fissures that we see in the rock. It's not happening. Um, so it shows how easily contamination can occur. So just because a conduit is small does not mean that it's, uh, uh, that it's filtering the water. And it's also important to recognize that even if you do not have caves and sinkholes, that does not mean that you are safe from groundwater contamination in cars. This is an example from Canada um, of a contamination problem that happened in May of 2000. Well number seven became contaminated with E. coli. Now they knew what happened, that the farmer somewhere off in the field spread manure, spread fertilizer in the field uh, for his plants. You know, it's, it's what you do in agriculture. You, no problem. But then what happened was that they had a very heavy rainstorm and the chlorinator that treated the water at well seven, the chlorinator failed. So it was a terrible series of coincidences. And so the bacteria got to the well. Okay, everyone understands what happens. So um, the Canadian government called some uh, hydrogeologists who are good hydrogeologists, but they are not cursed experts called them to do a study. And they used a computer model and uh, the computer drew this red line around the well. Um, they said, this is not cursed. It's limestone, but it's not cursed. There are no caves, there are no sinkholes. We don't have to treat it like a cursed aquifer. So they used this computer model and it showed, <clears throat> excuse me, that from this line, it takes water 720 hours to reach well seven. Why is 720 hours important? The reason is, <clears throat> excuse me again, is that within 72 hours, within three days, approximately 95% of bacteria like e. e. coli will die. And so this is 10 times longer, this is 30 days. And so certainly within 30 days, you would expect all the bacteria to die off, but it didn't. So how did it get there? They didn't understand. Well, some friends of mine um, and Stein Erics, who Stein Eric knows well, uh, excellent karst hydrogeologists who live in Canada, they said, let's do a test. And they went to well nine and they put a non-toxic dye in well nine and it reached well seven in only five hours. Then they went to well six. According to the model, it should have taken two months for water to go from well six to well seven. They put the dye in well six and it reached well seven in only 26 hours. And when they put cameras down these wells, what they found was these little finger size holes, these tiny conduits moving water along quite nicely, carrying the dye, carrying the contaminants. Now, many times people have told me, George, calm down. Okay, we understand 
that you think caves and karst are important, then yes, they are. But calm down. We 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 understand that they're important. And I say I will not calm down. No, I will not calm down because you don't understand how important they are. You do not understand how vulnerable they are. In this situation, seven people died. Over 2,300 people became ill. Many of these people needed new kidneys. Many of these people needed new livers because of this contamination. And this was preventable. If people understood how vulnerable Karst is, they would have put a second chlorinator on the well. They would have put an alarm. They would have done something to just automatically shut the well, you know, shut the well off uh, if, it, if, the, if the chlorinator failed. But people did not understand that. And so no one did anything wrong. It's just they did not understand that with cursed, you need to go an extra step to protect it. And so that's why we are doing this international year to help the world understand how important this is to make sure we do not have tragedies like this ever again. So other problems that we have in Karst are sinkhole collapse, doline collapse. There's two major types of collapse that occur. Um, what you see here is the larger type of collapse um, that we call a cover collapse. And we call it a cover collapse because in many places of the world, the limestone, the rock is covered by thick soil. And so the rock doesn't collapse, but the soil washes down into caves within the rock and then the soil collapses. And so here we have a soil collapse, a cover collapse over 100 meters in diameter uh, that has swallowed cars, businesses, homes, and done a lot of damage. Uh, now, the other type of collapse, of course, is the bedrock collapse, where the rock itself collapses down, and this occurred uh, along a roadway. When this occurred, suddenly five or six cars were trapped. Fortunately, no one was killed uh, or seriously injured. Um, so these are types of problems that we have. Collapses are a major problem around the world that people don't really recognize. And the reason is because one happens here, maybe a year or two, some, another one happens somewhere else or in a different location. We spend 10,000 euros fixing this, 5,000 somewhere else, maybe 50,000 somewhere else. But we don't look at the total cost. Five years ago, a friend of mine did a study of the total cost of collapse in the United States. And what he found was that there were over $300 million in only road damage, repairing road damage. This doesn't include the cost of the buildings, of the property, or of the lives that were lost in these collapses. So homes, businesses, cars, those aren't included in any of this. That's $300 in road damage, or $300 million in road damage. And we know it's a conservative number because he went to the states, to the 50 US states, and they reported sinkhole damage, but not all of the states record sinkhole damage. Just some of them say, well, this is how much we spent fixing roads, but maybe the road was old and you know, maybe it had a lot of sinkhole damage, maybe none. So not everyone reported sinkhole damage. If we looked, I think, at least in the United States, uh, at how much damage is done, the cost of sinkhole damage just in my country, we are easily looking at over $1 billion in damage. If we put that all in one location, and that's per year, a billion dollars per year, if we put all that damage in one location at one time, it would be like a major flood, a hurricane, a major fire. It would be in the news. There would be uh, government reports and studies and new laws, but because it's scattered around the country, people are not aware of it. And so this is another thing that we're trying to teach people about. So uh, we have also problems with destruction of caves uh, and karst areas. And I'll just summarize uh, because we don't have uh, much time, uh, but I'll summarize some of the impacts. The loss of archeological sites, paleontological resources, um, those are often destroyed when caves are destroyed. We lose special habitat, 
karst areas are some of the most biodiverse in the world and we lose that habitat and we lose that biodiversity with the destruction of caves in karst areas and karst aquifers. We lose surface and groundwater drainage to re replenish karst aquifers. And we lose important research sites to study all of these systems and more. Um, so uh, be before joining the National Cave and Karst Research Institute, I worked as a consultant and, uh, and I would advise my clients whenever possible, protect the cave. Um, even if you just cover it, you know, and you know where it is, but you don't destroy the cave, you just cover it up. It, the cave may have, have, may have some value. 60 years ago, we were just learning to spell DNA. And now there are so many incredible medical and technological advances we're doing with DNA. What are we learning today or haven't realized today that in 60 or 100 years may be incredibly valuable and may, be, and may exist in caves? So whenever possible, we should preserve these rare natural systems that can teach us so much that have been evolving over millions of years and may have an incredible value that we have not even dreamed about yet. So for the sciences, there are some sciences that are growing with, within caves and karst. Um, paleoclimatology is one of them that's growing, uh, especially growing because people are concerned about climate change. And so if you want to understand the future of the climate, you need to look back to understand past climates. And so some of the growing fields are paleontology, you know, the looking at remains of past life uh, that occur in caves and caves are wonderful places, rich places to study paleontology. My friend Stein Eric has spent many years studying speleothems around the world. Uh, they, within the crystal structure uh, of these speleothems, these decorations that you see in caves, you can find temperature signals, humidity signals of what past climates were like and when they were, and when they were deposited, when they were created. One of the things that's special about caves and, caves and karst is that some people will say, well, I can understand you know, temperature and humidity and some of, some of these other things because they drilled uh, ice cores up at, you know, up in Greenland or down in Antarctica. They drilled cores down in the middle of the ocean and looked at sediments. And that's excellent work, important research, but it tells you specifically what happened at the poles and specifically what happened in the middle of the ocean. It didn't tell you what happened right near your home. Whereas caves will be near your home. They will tell you what's happening on the continents. And so scientists are recognizing caves as having the richest data source for paleoclimates of all sources in the world. Uh, some of the other uh, sources of data that are just being appreciated are cave sediments. Uh, we can look at these deposits and not just look for vertebrate material from bones, but we can look at plant materials, pollen, spores, other materials. And also, if we look at the sediment structure that's buried or that may be preserved on the surface or maybe features preserved in the rock by past water erosion, we can understand paleohydrology, how aquifers functioned in the past. So there are many things that are unique to the cave environment when it comes to paleoclimatology. Environmental research is also a growing science uh, when it comes to cave and karst. As many communities are growing into karst areas, they are unfortunately discovering some of the problems and challenges of living in karst regions. Geophysical tools are nothing new. Uh, they've been used for decades. Uh, but now with computers, we can use them far more efficiently and more powerfully. This is from a geophysical survey I did, and it's found I identified a cave here uh, below the surface. There's no sinkhole, anything here to show that, uh, that it might exist in that location. Um, so geophysical surveys are valuable tools to understand uh, and plan where you want to develop your community, your activities. Additionally, we can do habitat mapping using powerful tools such as GIS, Geographic Information Systems. This is a map I did uh, in Texas. You know, this is the city of San Antonio. Um, 
And what we're looking at is the distribution of endangered species habitat. So looking at geological and biological factors, these red areas here are where we know endangered cave species exist. The gold areas have a high probability of those species existing. The lavender areas have a very low chance. The green areas we need to study a little bit more. And then everywhere else, there's no, no possibility of the species existing there. So this is a powerful management tool for the community uh, to use and say, okay, I'm not going to develop in this area because it has endangered species and I'm gonna to have to do extra studies and I'm gonna have government regulations and other headaches. Uh, instead, these areas are now being set aside and protected and being made into parklands, which is good not just for you know, the cave species, but it's also good for the karst aquifer and the city's drinking water supply. Other tools are remote sensing. Uh, for people, geographers, geologists, we usually talk about remote sensing as cameras and imagery up in space, uh, up in airplanes that take photos of the land. Now we have other tools such as LIDAR, the laser measurement of the land, uh, and also photogrammetry, taking pictures and overlapping the pictures in, in computers to understand what's happening at the land surface. But we can also use those surface, those, those tools, not just for the surface, but underground in caves. So for example, this is a cave uh, in my dissertation study area called Cave Without a Name, a uh, funny name, but uh, it's a show cave in Texas. And many years ago, I looked at this wall trying to understand the flow direction. Uh, and I wasn't sure which way the water flowed because it was important for my research and, and understanding how the aquifer worked. I thought it went from right to left and I, that's what I decided, but I was never sure. Now with new technology, I went in with my friend here from San Antonio College and he's got a camera on a type tripod. And in five minutes, he took many photos of this wall, put them together in his computer and it drew that wall beautifully. And then I could look at it carefully and make measurements. And I was right. The water did does flow or did in the past flow in that direction. And so I could also make accurate measurements of how much water was moving uh, and many other important things to understand the hydrologic system. So these are growing tools that we are developing in the cave and karst sciences. Now, as we also uh, think about uh, moving from what I call inner space to outer space, over the past 20 years especially, microbiology has greatly advanced in the cave sciences. So we have people going into caves, sampling the caves to see what may exist uh, and studying those microorganisms. Uh, you know, beads on a string is so what's called, uh, is, a, is a general name for this microorganism because that's what it looks like. It looks like beads uh, on a string. Um, and we're seeing a marriage, a joining, a partnership between biologists, microbiologists, and geologists because we're finding how the microbiology isn't just important to the biology, to the ecosystem of the cave, but critically important in many ways to the growth and origin of many, many caves. But as I call this from inner space to outer space, let's look a little bit further to planetary studies. We now know of about 300 cave entrances on the moon. This here is Mars, planet Mars, and we know of about 1,400 entrances to caves on Mars. And these are some of those entrances. Here's a scale, 100 meters. So this entrance is about 300 meters in diameter. So in the United States, NASA, in Europe, in Europe the European Space Agency and other space agencies are looking at caves for multiple reasons. For one, um, it's a great place to go and establish a colony. If these things, as large as these are, 300 meters across, uh, they are a good place to put our first colonies, our first settlements inside, uh, to, you know, in, inside these things to protect the future astronauts from all the processes, all the damage, all the risk that can occur on the surface of the planet. Uh, additionally, if water exists, and we know it does exist on Mars and the moon, 
uh, it's going to be in sheltered locations and we're more likely to find it in caves. And so if we go up there, we're going to need to find water. And lastly, and perhaps more, most importantly, certainly in the point of curiosity, we all ask, is there life on Mars? And if life exists, it will not be on the surface of the planet. The conditions there are horrible, are just too, too brutal. If life exists on Mars, it's going to be small. It will be microscopic. It will be in a sheltered environment, much like what we would expect for a cave, someplace where that would have moisture. And so caves are being targeted as the primary sources to look for life. So whether you're studying caves on the surface or you're interested in going uh, or on, on, on Earth or you're interested on in other planets, uh, there's uh, uh, an important place for you in the cave and karst sciences. So if you want to learn more uh, and to stay educated, certainly you can look at my institute's website. It's been down here in the corner, uh, but of course it's up here. In about three months, I think in April, we'll be ready to launch a brand new website with a lot more information. So uh, please visit it then. Um, and the International Year is brought to you by the International Union of Speleology, uh, where I'm currently have the honor to be president. And there's much information about speleological organizations and activities around the world, uh, and a lot of information there to, to look at. Um, the International Union, my institute, and a couple of other partners have worked to create the Karst Information Portal. This is a free library of everything related to caves and karst. We have newsletters, journals from over 20 different countries around the world, um, and they're free for, for use. So just go there, search, and if you want to add the newsletter from your organization, let me know, please. You know, um, you know, just contact the people there at the, you know, at the website, and they'll be glad to, uh, to add your material to the collection and share your information. The International Year of Caves and Karst website, where you'll find more information about the year, activities that are going on, but also about caves and karst. Um, you know, please visit that. I think you'll, be, you'll find a lot of stuff, a lot of things that will interest you. And lastly, I want to mention the Explorers Club. Now, the Explorers Club is not a cave and karst organization, uh, but it has many cave explorers and cave scientists. The reason I mention it here is because I'm speaking mostly to people in Portugal, and they are looking at opening a chapter of the Explorers Club uh, in Portugal sometime soon. I know that they're planning uh, to have some lectures about caves and karst later this year, I believe in July. So uh, the Explorers Club is a fascinating, a fabulous organization and so if you're interested, there's the website, go check them out. Um, and then lastly, just to invite everyone uh, to join us for the International Year. If you're already a cave explorer or a cave scientist, I think it's natural for you to be involved. Please do what you can to educate uh, people in your area. Because it's the International Year, some people think they need to organize a big international event. It can be a small event. You can talk to 10 people. Uh, and you don't know who those 10 people will be, uh, talk to a classroom of children. You know, in that classroom may be a little girl who will be the next uh, president of the UIS, uh, who will be the next major cave scientist, who will be the me next major cave explorer, a little boy who may you know, be the next cave manager of a show cave or of a cave uh, park, UNESCO World Heritage Sites. You know, whatever you can do to inspire them. And if you're not a cave explorer or a cave scientist, we also invite you to join us. If you teach your organizations and your friends about this, because we are all affected by caves and karst. Everyone on the planet is affected. They don't have to live in a cave and karst area. Remember the food, the medicines, the products that we're getting, the cultural value that we get from these things. These are things that touch everyone. So everyone in the world is affected even if they don't go into a cave, uh, even if they don't live in a karst area. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Um, and if there's, and I can just leave it here um, if, uh, if you would like, if, so you can write down this information if it's valuable to you, uh, and I'd be happy to answer questions.
Thank you very much, George, for your very interesting and uh, inspiring talk. Caves are really, really important and karst areas are really uh, special places. It was very impressive to see um, the, the numbers of the economical value of caves and karst. So when you put everything together, I think we have um, strong arguments uh, away from science to talk about the importance of, of these spaces and, and communication places where, where it's difficult to, to put this into numbers. So we have people from several places that are with us in, in the chat. Marta will talk about that after. I will just, um, I just want to ask you a, a very small question. So what do you think is the percentage of cave area in the world that we actually know. I'm not saying okay. mapping, just, just visiting, just how much do you think we actually know? The, um, the study that we published in 2017 um, showed that it was uh, about 16 to 18%. Um, the way we did the study, it's not, it's not exactly, uh, it's not an exact number, but the problem with that number and why it's an underestimate is, is that we, the, the grant that paid for this study did not pay for evaporate karst. And so where I live, I've got uh, limestone karst on one side of me and evaporite karst on the other side. And so the evaporite karst was not well mapped. So I think if we add the evaporite karst, it will be like 20%. But this is only what's on the surface because there are many places around the world where the karst is buried beneath other non-karst rocks, but yet we have collapses that occur. We drill into it and we, and, and we pump water out of it. We tap into it for, very, for various uses. Um, and so if we look at karst areas that are buried that have no surface exposure, uh, but directly affect us, the number may be huge. Just looking at my country, um, you know, we, we might be looking, in my country, 25% of the, of the country is karst or pseudo karst. Uh, but if we look at these covered karst areas, maybe 40, 45, 50% may be karst. And that's just my country, because uh, I know it best. I expect we might see something similar around the world. Uh, so that's some other research that, uh, that we need to do. Um, and I just want to also comment about economic value because you made a good point um, uh, about this. When it comes to water, I wasn't even counting water. Think about what would happen to your community if all the water stopped. You know, think about the economic impact if all your water was, if your water was polluted. If you, if you had to take water that was clean and now build major water treatment plants or the water was used up and there wasn't enough water for everyone. Uh, you know, and so I'm not even talking about that. So in that case, we're talking about many more billions and billions uh, of, uh, of euros and dollars um, of, uh, of economic value and impact. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Stein Eric, I believe you have a question as well. Yeah, thank you, George. This was a very nice and very informative uh, 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 lecture, and I'm sure that uh, many of the listeners who are not familiar with Karst will also have great uh, benefit from it. I was thinking about uh, um, what do you think is the most um, or uh, what would be the most vulnerable part of, uh, or the most challenging part of cave and karst management in the future? Would that be the chemical and mechanical pollution, or do you think it would be the microbiological contamination and things like that, that we risk to kind of overfeed or, or extinguish organisms before we learn them to know? Uh, do you have an idea where the most uh, uh, vulnerable spectrum would be? Um, I'm, I'll answer this in two ways. I think the, uh, the biggest problem is in management and in policy and protection. Um, because uh, um, 
from from the technical point of view, I think, I think, th th from the technical point of view, water will drive the main issues, because I, the microbiology is very important. But the contaminants will reach the microbes through water, and so if the water is contaminated, then you're contaminating the aquifer as well as the microbes, as well as the uh, uh, the other fauna. Uh, that, that lives in, in, in the cave um, uh, and in your karst area. So part of the challenge in management is making people aware that you cannot protect the cave by just protecting the cave entrance. Mm -hmm. You have to understand the, the entire system, the drainage area for the cave. Um, in some areas, I recommend very strongly uh, avoid the karst. If the karst is a relatively small or narrow area, for example, I gave the example from San Antonio, um, the city is south of the karst, but it's growing north. Don't grow north, grow hmm. east, west, south. Hmm. North is your water supply. North is your beautiful karst area with habitat for many endangered species and other animals, beautiful park areas. And so if we protect the karst area the drainage basins as a whole, we're then protecting biology, microbiology, uh, all these other values. Caves are not being destroyed by quarries. They're not being filled in with, uh, with concrete. Uh, so uh, cultural and other uh, paleoclimate researches, uh, resources are being protected. Um, and so, um, uh, and so the, I think the big challenge is making people aware uh, of that. Now, there are, uh, there are some karst areas, of course, that are very large. Um, you, you can't tell a city that's a community, uh, okay, pick up and move 1,000 or 100 kilometers, you know? And so that, that's not realistic. And so there are ways of protecting and managing karst, too complicated to get into here. Um, so we can live learn to live on karst in more sustainable fashions. And we need to learn that. But wherever we can, we need to minimize uh, our growth uh, and development of karst um, and learn to, to, to manage this karst as a system as opposed to a feature like a cave entrance or a doline or a sinking stream. You know, we need to understand and manage the system as a whole. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. George Verney, for this fantastic and very impressive talk. And um, actually, um, first, uh, thanking also uh, all the people from several countries that are also uh, attending and participating in this talk. Um, we will briefly just mention some of the countries that people that are mentioning in the chat, not just Portugal, but we have actually people with us from Sweden, Ireland, Poland, Spain, Bulgaria, Brazil, Norway, Greece, Scotland, Turkey, Australia, and Germany. So we are really worldwide. And um, we have a, a question on the live chat on the YouTube from uh, Carolina Diaz. Uh, besides saying also that she really enjoyed the talk, she would like to ask, what methods do you use to map the morphology of karsts in depth? Right now, I think the best methods are these remote sensing methods that I talked about. Um, on the surface, LIDAR, I think, is the best um, uh, because it will essentially see through the vegetation to map surface morphologies in detail. Um, but also, photographic imagery on the surface is quite useful. Um, I've worked with some archaeologists who are using multispectral imaging that, uh, and, and this has not been used yet by, uh, by geologists or hydrologists that I'm aware of, uh, or at least not very much, but using different, different wavelengths of light. I haven't studied it myself carefully, uh, but it will reveal some features below the soil, certainly uh, archeological sites that might be there. Inside caves, you can use LIDAR, you can use photogrammetry. Um, and uh, I like photogrammetry uh, because I can take my phone here and go click, 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 click. And so I think all of us have one of these things now. Uh, and then there are simple inexpensive computer programs where you can combine the images 
and you can have a beautiful 3D morphologic map of the cave, or you can make measurements and make all sorts of analyses. So I think those uh, are those are the two most important tools uh, in 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 my in my opinion. Uh, could I add a little supplement Please. to that? Because uh, in spite of that, in all the uh, technical advances we have with the lidar and everything, and especially with the with the with the cave surveying things, which has changed completely during the last decade or something, you know. But I I think that it's very important also for the audience and for all the young people who are listening that the cavers themselves will never get out of work. Because if you really want to penetrate and see the deepest parts of a cave system, you have to explore it. And we could never have known that the deepest cave in the world is more than 2000 meters deep if it wasn't for people who went into it and actually explored it. Would you think so, George, that we should, we should, up, we should, we should uh, kind of challenge the young people to keep going on? <laughs> I, I completely agree. That's why the theme of the International Year here above my head, explore, understand, protect. Yeah. Unless you explore something, you won't understand it. And if you don't understand it, you can't protect it. You can't study it. You don't know its needs. Um, I've, I've worked with some excellent geologists who were afraid to go into caves. Okay, mm. and, and I understand that. Going into caves is not for everyone. But some of them were so afraid that they just would not even want to see cave information or cave maps. And there was one, one person in particular who finally went into, uh, into a cave and he saw some sediments. And, um, and he came and wrote, you know, made many papers and talks about these sediments as if it was news. You know, for those of who have been in caves, I mean, we've been crawling and walking by studying the sediments for years. For him, it was, it was a new insight to, mm -hmm. to the cave system. So mapping and all of these are good tools, but work with your cave explorers, even if you do not want to go into a cave. And, uh, uh, and, and it really annoys me as I get older that I cannot go as far or as deep uh, that, uh, as I used to when I was 19 years old. Um, but work with the people, see what's in there because it will tell you so much. Um, and so again, explore, Steiner is completely right. Explore, understand, protect, um, and explore however you can, either by physically exploring, scientifically exploring remotely, um, but, uh, but we need the cave explorers. Um, uh, unlike many sciences, the cave explorers are critical to cave and car scientists, to cave and car science. They create the map, they tell us what's there. They make it possible for the rest of the science uh, to happen. And as a hydrogeologist, when I look at a, uh, at a cave map, I'm looking at the permeability structure of a karst aquifer. I can look at that map and say, I know how that aquifer works, how that aquifer is organized. A biologist can look at it and say, okay, I can see different ecosystems, you know, uh, or where uh, ecological areas will, will exist within this area. Uh, an archeologist can look at it with their specialty. So uh, I, I have great respect for cave explorers. I started as one, I still am one. Uh, and it sometimes annoys uh, some people who say, oh, Dr. Venny, he's this and that. And I, in my view, my most important title is Cave Explorer. So <laughs> everything else came later. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, dear George. Um, Stein, Eric, and I, we also shared that with you. Um, that came, our science came after our caves. Uh, and that's also the path of, of many cave researchers. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today with us after a long day that started with the opening ceremony of the International Year of Caves and Karst. Thank you very much. Thank you Stein, Eric and Marta for being here um, today with us as well. Thank you to our audience. We have had more than a hundred persons watching um, um, George's talk um, today live and many more will have the opportunity to see it later because it will be available on YouTube. 
Uh, we will be back soon with another cave show about another interesting topic on cave science. Stay tuned, take care, cave softly, and share your research and your passion for caves and for cave protection. Thank you very much. Have a good mm -hmm. evening.